Hey guys, what's up? In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about an interview that Andrew Huberman did, a neuroscientist out of Stanford who's doing all sorts of brain studies with him and his team. And he talks about the importance and the effects on our body of breathing. He goes through four different types of breathing from meditation to a simple slow in inhale, slow exhale, to, he doesn't describe it as Wim Hof method, but Wim Hof method, which is basically a hyperventilation. And then my favorite one is box breathing. So if you want to get guided through a box breath, it's very simple. Five seconds in, five second hold, five second exhale, five second hold out. If you are interested in more about these breathing techniques, go to my website, connectedperformance.life. Also, I will be talking more about Andrew Huberman and his science behind all of these, all of these things and all of these understandings, as he likes to say, esoteric things that have been taught for thousands of years and yogis have been doing it for thousands of years. And so he actually puts some science and data behind it and how these breaths are very important in slowing down our everyday heart rate, not just during our meditation or during the breath. It actually allows us to control our heart rate and so we can respond and we can actually master our life. And so Andrew Huberman, thank you so much. Check out this video, I break it down. I talk about every point that he makes. And so I wanted to add some of my thoughts and opinions and my own feelings about what he's talking about, the science behind breathing. So check it out. This is something that I, I do a lot of public education on social media and some lectures here at Stanford. I don't think I've ever really talked about how our, we breathe controls our heart rate. We wanna to learn to move up and down that continuum where we are in control. How can we control our level of alertness using breathing? This is a beautiful MRI, not from my lab, of the diaphragm, the skeletal muscle that lies below our heart and moves our lungs. So that's a very direct and simple an important relationship between how we breathe and our level of alertness and calmness. And it doesn't involve anything esoteric. It doesn't involve any kind of breath work per se. This clip is very funny to me actually. And it's very cool because he's actually saying that it doesn't involve anything esoteric or any kind of breath work. Yogis have been doing this for thousands of years. So that's why I think it's funny is because breath work and, and yoga has been going on for thousands of years. But we in Western society, we have to find that that medical science behind it. And it's amazing that we that we can provide that medical science behind it. And it's amazing. It honestly is amazing. But it's kind of funny that we've known this for thousands of years. But in Western culture, we decide that only when we prove it, even though we know what yogis have felt for thousands of years, that it's actually helping our alertness and helping the way that we live. And it's helping. It's just helping our brain. When we inhale, our diaphragm moves down because the lungs expand, which creates more space for our heart. Blood flows a little bit more slowly through the heart. And then the brain sends a signal to speed up our heart rate. The simple way to translate this is if you want your heart rate to increase, if you want to be more alert, you should inhale more and longer than you exhale. Now that immediately says that for somebody that's stressed, the last thing you wanna tell them is to take a deep breath. The other thing you don't want to tell them is to calm down because it's very hard to, to control the mind with the mind. What we're about to talk about is using the mind to control the body and then the body to control the mind and then to take control of the reciprocal relationship between the two. Another important point that he brings up right there is the fact that he's saying you can't use the mind to control the mind. You can actually use the body to control the mind and then the mind to control the body and then the reciprocal relationship between that. And so it's pretty, pretty cool that, you know, just taking a slow, steady inhale and then a, a kind of an exhale, just a regular exhale is actually very beneficial for our mindset and for our body set. When we exhale, our diaphragm moves up in our body cavity that creates less space for the heart. Blood flows more quickly through the heart and the brain sends a signal to slow down heart rate. So if you want to relax, extend your exhales relative to your inhales and make the exhales, it's, it's sort of hard to think about making exhales deeper, but extend them. For those of you that actually have practiced Wim Hof, you understand this concept on the slow exhale and how it can actually like, you can control your mind and you can understand that like, okay, I'm slowing down, my panic is going down and I'm exhaling slowly. And that's the concept of Wim Hof is like, when you're in the ice bath, the slow exhale for me anyways, was something that I caught onto as far as like 
a slow exhale helped me control my mind and my body and, and help that panic subside. And so it's very important what he's saying here with the exhale on the slow exhale is very, very cool what he's talking about and how we can control our heart rate. Now, a lot of you people out there watching this don't even understand what diaphragmatic breathing is. And so it's very cool that you are just seeing this concept right here of the diaphragm taking the lungs and expanding them this way. And I've said a hundred thousand times to people is that your stressors are up here, your calming nerves are in your stomach. And what happens is when you breathe into your chest, instead of your diaphragm, ex you know, elongating your lungs and, and giving yourself more oxygen, you're cramping up your lungs and you're actually getting less oxygen. So like he said earlier, if you're just telling somebody to inhale and telling somebody to take a deep breath, well, if you're breathing short and you're, 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 con you're compressing your lungs because you're not using your diaphragm to expand your lungs this way, then we're not getting the oxygen that we need to calm down, to control our heart rate, to control our mind, to control our body. So pay attention. Diaphragmatic breathing is something that a lot of people watching this video have no idea what it is. Your diaphragm is connected to a lot of your organs in your body. And I love this video because he's actually just showing the science behind what a lot of people have been preaching for thousands of years. The other thing that is a very useful tool is this notion of physiological size. This is a phenomenon that was discovered in the 30s. Physiological size are a pattern of breathing that all animals, including humans, engage in spontaneously when carbon dioxide gets too high in our system. Our trigger to breathe and a big aspect of the stress response is not getting enough oxygen and having too much carbon dioxide build up in our bloodstream and lungs. So there's a pattern of breathing that we all do in sleep and in conditions of claustrophobia that looks like this. It's inhale, inhale, then exhale. Inhale, inhale, then exhale. And what this does is it maximally inflates these little sacs in the lungs. Our lungs aren't two big bags of air. Our lungs are actually millions of little sacs that allow us a big increase in the surface area of our lungs. You'll see the blood vessels innervate these little sacs. And when we do a double inhale followed by an exhale, we maximally offload the carbon dioxide. <laughs> there actually is many Kundalini exercises and breathing techniques that that do this. The <laughs> and so once again, yogis and yoga techniques and breathing techniques and the stuff that he says that's esoteric actually has been used. So it isn't esoteric. It's just general knowledge that's been happening for thousands of years. We've just lost con connection to that knowledge of this breathing technique and, and a lot of breathing techniques. And so I just love how he's just coming out with this science. So hopefully a lot of you guys that are just so attached to like, you have to see the proof and the data and the and, and you have to see the science behind it in order to even start doing it. I hope this resonates with you and you actually start taking into account that these breathing techniques can actually change your life. Now, this isn't some hack or trick. Animals, and we do this in sleep, we do it in claustrophobic environments, and you'll see that children and adults do this after sobbing when they need to catch their breath. The double inhale reinflates the collapsed, what they're called, avioli of the lungs. Like you would blow up a balloon in a kid's party, you're going to give one push and then another one to maximally inhale them and then offload the carbon dioxide. So once again, this isn't a hack or a trick. It's not a hack or a trick. It's been practiced for thousands of years. It's been used and it, it's, it's used daily amongst a lot of people, not just yogis, but breath work specialists or experts or whatever you want to say. Breathing techniques are huge. Breathing techniques actually help. I hope you guys are listening and paying attention to what he's talking about. It's not a hack. And also, like, our bodies just do it naturally. When we're, when we're crying, you see your baby crying and it does that kind of move. It's because, and then you see it calming down. And that's, that right, right in front of our eyes is science being proven that, that our body knows what to do in every situation to calm ourselves down. So pay attention. So we've been exploring this experimentally in a rigorous test of 125 subjects that are now out there in the world. They're wearing, um, they're called whoop bands. Uh, we've, uh, they've been generous in donating to us uh, monitors that allow us to measure heart rate variability, breathing, sleep duration and quality, et cetera. And each person in a different group is assigned to a different group for 28 days and then swapped to a different group where they perform a particular type of meditation or breath work. And we wanna to compare to meditation specifically because 
I have no beef against meditation, but it's very hard for us to know if someone is meditating a particular way. Oh, now we're using breath work techniques. Okay. I like you, Andrew Humerman, but you know, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's sort of contradicting, but yeah, it, it's breathing techniques and, and breath work. And, and he talks about meditation here and there's no way to measure meditation. If he's using the whoop band, he should be using the muse, which is basically a whoop band for your, for your forehead, which tells you if you're in meditative state or not. So, uh, you can study meditation too. So I, I hope that they start studying meditation as well. Meditation versus specific breathing protocols. I just want to mention, this is a somewhat complicated graph, but what we're quite happy about is that when we've assessed the subjects in this study, almost all of them say that it's very easy to do this protocol, which is only five minutes a day of a particular either meditation or breathing practice. I'll talk about each one and I'll share some data. Literally five minutes a day, he's going to show you how five minutes a day of some sort of breathing technique can change the chain, basically change your life and how you respond on a day-to-day, -day, moment to moment aspect. First of all, meditation. When we look at average heart rate, and this is one particular subject, very preliminary data. Yellow is before, red is during, and blue is after the particular meditation protocol, which is five minutes a day of mindfulness meditation, eyes closed, sort of typical sit sitting third eye meditation, if you will. We find is that their heart rate it's quite variable. There's across 20, 28 days, there's a slight drop during the meditation, but it rebounds back to where it was prior to meditation. Pretty cool. I mean, meditation, I'm all about whatever works for you, works for you. Like if it works for you, if meditation works for you, there's also many different ways of meditating. He talks about just sitting there doing the third eye meditation where you're just sitting there quietly, focus on your breath, the inflow and the outflow. And that works for people. Sometimes moving meditation works as well. Sometimes gardening is a meditation, by the way. Sometimes driving is a meditation. There's different meditations for different people. So whatever works for you, works for you. He's talking about specifically sitting down, spending five minutes to focus on your thoughts, to focus on your breath and just be. We have a, a pattern of cyclic or physiological sighing, also called slow breathing. So this is people doing double inhale, exhale, double inhale, exhale for five minutes a day of dedicated practice, which we track. And this is very interesting because you'll notice that the pattern of heart rate is very rhythmic, both entering and during and after the cyclic physiological sighing, aka slow breathing protocol. As far as we know, this protocol has never been explored in humans in a rigorous controlled study before although you heard the basis for looking at this pattern of breathing in this way in the previous slides. So it's very interesting because it looks a lot like heart rate variability. We haven't mapped this exactly to all the features that are going on with them physiologically and subjectively in terms of how much they perceive life stress. Those data are still being analyzed, but this is a very different pattern of heart rate based on a change in the pattern of breathing for five minutes a day. To me, that chart didn't really show anything. It didn't ch show a change in anything. So I don't know if, I, I couldn't tell you, just to me, that chart didn't look like it changed anything at all. So a slow inhale, slow exhale, slow inhale, exhale. I mean, I don't know if it even changed anything at all, but I'm excited for the next two charts. And this is strikingly different. We also have a protocol that involves deliberate hyperventilation, hyperventilation, excuse me, which is inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, very rapidly hyperventilating, and then emptying the lungs, discarding all the carbon dioxide and sitting with lungs empty for a brief period of time and then repeating for five minutes a day. So you'll notice that the heart rate shoots up dramatically during this hyperventilation, which it shouldn't surprise you now, right? Because you know that a lot of inhales are going to promote faster heart rate. And then afterward, there's a decrease. And what's striking here is how regular, this is across 28 days, how tight the data are, how these dots overlay one another so tightly is very interesting. And we're, we're exploring whether or not this allows people to buffer the stress response. This is sort of self-induced stress inoculation. To steal the words or borrow, I should say, of my colleague, David Spiegel, it's not just about the state you're in, it's about how you got there and whether or not you had anything to do with it. So when people self-induce stress, it can teach them to teach themselves and their nervous system is really what we're referring to, to be comfortable in uncomfortable states. We hear about resilience, grit, and mental toughness, but what is that really? Well, we hear about being comfortable, being uncomfortable. What is that really? For us as biologists, we think of that in terms of 
this continuum of autonomic arousal, deliberately walking up the staircase and knowing that you can deliberately walk down. I'm confused why he's not even mentioning Wim Hof in this because I know hyperventilation wasn't invented by Wim Hof, but he is the on the forefront of teaching this to people worldwide so they can control their nervous system. They can actually control their autoimmune system. And so I'm, I'm kind of confused why maybe he has talked to Wim Hof before. I don't know. But in this particular chart, I'm confused why he doesn't say, you know, this is something that a guy named Wim Hof is teaching around the world as a breathing technique to help people control their own nervous system. That he actually is teaching people to control their adrenaline. And then we also have a category of what's called box breathing, which involves inhale, hold, exhale, hold for five minute duration. And that seems to lead to increases, surprisingly, at least in this, to us in this subject, in heart rate, but then no decrease in average heart rate post protocol. So we're exploring these protocols. We're looking at, we're trying to find the minimal effective dose, just five minutes a day of something that's purely mechanical. A lot of people struggle with meditation because they don't know if they're doing it correctly. They don't know if they're accessing the states that they should be. And one of the great joys of being at Stanford for me and in partnering with David's group and with Jamie Zeitzer is that we're looking at how this also impacts sleep. We're looking at how it impacts uh, psychiatric illness and pain. And we're looking at how it manages performance or can impact performance in the cognitive realm and the physical realm. It, you know, it radiates out into a number of different measures and dimensions that we'd like to get to. But right now, the question is, what is the minimal effective and maximal impact protocol that we can provide people? Would you just look at this chart? This is by far my favorite breath. I teach it to everybody that I work with. All of my students begin on a regimen of box breath. Box breath, two rounds of it, takes 40 seconds of your life. It can change your life. He's talking about five minutes over a month's period can actually alter the way that you respond in real life. It lowers your heart rate after the fact of practicing this. So it raises it during because of the breath holds and your body kind of sort of panicking a little bit. And then it actually allows you to lower your heart rate on a regular basis so you can control the way that you act and respond and go about your day. Isn't that amazing? We have science backing stuff that has been hot for years. And so that's cool. I hope that everybody that is just married to science actually goes and practices these things. And there's four things here that you can practice and try out. Whatever works for you, works for you. To me, the slow in, slow out on the chart didn't really sh show much. The Wim Hof breathing or the hyperventilation, wow, that was an amazing chart for real. And then even just the box breath, which like I said, I teach to all of my students. It doesn't matter how old you are. I teach it to all my students. I recommend that you guys go try it. I have a video on my website that you, that you can just follow along with if you don't know exactly how to go about it. I'm telling you, man, these breathing techniques, these esoteric things as he refers to, can change your life. So please try them out. So Andrew Huberman, thank you so much for actually presenting these charts and your and your team and your, your scientists. And, and honestly, this is cool. We'd like to create a suite of tools that are cost-free, very accessible. You can imagine anyone who can breathe would do this. We might even you know, be able to, to induce it using some mechanical devices and technology, but this is really using the technology of the diaphragm, heart, breathing, nervous system relationship that we were all endowed with from birth. There's no neural plasticity required.